Hey folks, I'm at Westbrook Supply. There's Fletch. How's it going, man? Good, how are you? Tell me, just give me an intro. Tell me what this event is this evening. Uh, this event is the River Fasten Seminar. So we got uh, some of the top players in the field to come give some good information. Uh, and uh, we're gonna eat some barbecue, drink some beer, hang cool. out, and uh, share some good information. Right on. I think I'm up third, right? Uh, I believe so, yeah, either second or third. Uh, we, okay. Yeah. We're making it up as we go along, so we can figure it out. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm going to do a presentation on basically the the sort of exploratory fishing, you know, for different black bass in, in rivers across the United States. And, you know, I've got a PowerPoint presentation. That's what the rest of this video is, but we're going to take a look at the shop real quick. Yeah, yeah, come on. This is a really cool looking shop. I mean, that right off that. Uh, Bureau is, is striking. Uh, yes, that's a local guy uh, named Josh May. Uh, he does some fantastic work. He's a fisherman, tattoo artist, and uh, he made some of my favorite t-shirts and stickers and I uh, had to have him do something to kind of put our stamp on the shop. Is this all but, his? Yeah, those are all his, uh, some of his designs there. Very cool. And then this is the the Sholey over here that someone's gonna... Uh, yeah, this is the one give we're giving away today. So this is the Moon Rock Sholey. Uh, sharp looking boat with the uh, teak deck pads. And uh, of course, the uh, can't go anywhere without the uh, kayak cushion there. Right? So. Very cool. Well, I'm gonna do what I can to help you guys set up for this and then um, the rest of this video will be my part of the presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Look forward to it. All right, guys, we're going to get this started. Uh, we're going to start with Jeff Little. Uh, I, how do I introduce you? I don't it's, uh, I can do it. Yeah, I, get, I don't have much voice, but I can introduce this guy. You know, Jeff's been doing this uh, kayak fishing thing for a long, long time. If you just go back and you do any Google imaging searching on kayak fishing or whatever, you'll probably find pictures of him or articles with Jeff, um, videos especially. You may know him from his uh, YouTube channel, um, the little, the little, always gets it, the little stuff. I've heard people confuse it, saying the little things, but it's the little stuff on YouTube. Um, and obviously working with Torquedo, but you've done a ton of it in the industry. But I mainly just know Jeff from being just an old school pioneer of river fishing in the in the kayak fishing space, and particularly up in your neck of the woods, you know, that mid Atlantic area. Whether you're talking the you know, Susquehanna or the New or the Potomac, this guy is all over the place on him. But river fish behavior are the same everywhere. I've been to the Amazon jungle and I've caught peacock bass there and they ambush the same way. So it's pretty cool to see that a lot of the stuff that Jeff was doing, I was doing here in Georgia for shoal bass. But um, yeah, it's just been a staple in our, in our industry. Working with so many of the manufacturers of boats, especially with Torquedo now, it's been pretty cool to see. Being at tournaments, big events, just being a presence is what Jeff Little has been all about. And uh, we can't thank you enough for what you've done to help get the sport to this level, quite frankly, and the fact that he, you're educating others um, with the knowledge you have. You know, a lot of people, me in particular, I love to educate, but at the same time, I kind of like to hold stuff back, because that fish the tournament. So Jeff doesn't. He just gives up all the juice. And we have so many phone calls all the time. He's like, I'm thinking about doing a video about this. I'm like, Please don't do it, dude. Like, you're giving away all this stuff for free that is a little bit of an advantage for some of us that know these things already because we learned them the hard way. But he's got a great thing going. So, Jeff, share a little bit with us about, uh, you know, fishing for, uh, what is this, river bass fishing in the USA. So, all right. Thanks for... So, I have the, uh, the privilege of, of fishing all across the United States, uh, sometimes in Canada and Mexico too, and you know I get to fish saltwater, inshore, Great Lakes, and and all sorts of lakes everywhere. But I've worked into to my job where I cover I actually average about forty thousand miles a year on my truck. Um, I've been able to work in uh, just. Solo trips on my own. Sometimes, you know, I'm filming, you know, notable anglers in in kayak fishing. You'll see a lot of that on the YouTube channel. The little stuff. Um, you know, it's a privilege to be able to do that. But I work in 
days for, for just me. And I've done it in the last week. Um, I've, I've had two solo trips, one on the French Broad. You know, I had a down day that I could, I could just go explore on my own, and one day on the Pigeon River. And, you know, my, my favorite, people ask, what's your favorite river to fish? You've, you've kind of fished all over. And my favorite river to fish is, is the next one I haven't seen yet. And when you have that sort of um, ethic of exploration, you're going to have skunk trips. You're going to pick a, pick a blue ribbon on, a, you know, on Google Maps and look at it and say, I think that's it. I think I want to go there and let's just get a show of hands. Who's had a skunk trip in, in the last year? Right? If you're not having skunk trips, if you're not having skunk trips, you're not exploring enough to find water that, that could be just absolutely amazing. Uh, and, and that's what does it for me is, is to, you know, not go where someone said, oh, you got to float from so-and-so bridge down to this, this access here. It's amazing. Make sure you hit the outside bend on the third bank and, or, or you know, when I get to, to get out and explore and really just see water I've never seen before, that's what does it for me. That's what makes me happy is to, to you know, see water I've never seen before and, and hopefully have some success and learn some lessons. Uh, the lessons that I teach are, are in the following you know, different playlists on, on, the, uh, on the YouTube channel. Kayak fishing skills, I put a lot of the safety related stuff there, the paddling skills, but also logistics of, of um, you know, learning how to good, find good water on, on Google Maps using the Onyx app. I know Chad's back there filming and I got to teach, uh, <laughs> teach a little bit about, you know, what is legal access and, and got into using the Onyx. We'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, water trailblazing here. Uh, this is where I get into places where I bring a a chainsaw and a handsaw to get to places that like other people, you know, paddle or motor up to and just say, just stop. And they're like, ah, it's not worth it. Uh, being able to open up water that other people haven't seen in a long time, it gets you to the stupid fish, the dumb fish that never see a lure. And it's amazing. It's fun. It's the funnest way to fish, uh, you know, in small water that, you know, other people just aren't seeing. Um, and obviously, I have pattern specific, you know, lessons, you know, in videos for mostly small mouth, but I do have a, a pretty good, you know, I'm in Maryland and we have a lot of tidal largemouth fisheries, you know, uh, in Virginia, the tidal Potomac, but also Maryland Eastern Shore. Uh, tidal largemouth has its own little set of rules on, in terms of knowing the tides and knowing, you know, the right presentations for those fish. And certainly my travels in here in the southeast of the rivers with the, the spotted bass. I've done less with the shoal, shoal bass. I've caught a few, uh, but certainly the spotted bass. Um, I have enough content there to warrant a playlist. So definitely take a moment and subscribe. And um, that's really where you're going to get your, you know, your more in-depth um, lessons on, on presentation specifics than I can teach in this, in this uh, seminar today. So, um, how to find new productive water. We, we talked, I mentioned the, the Google Maps is, is one. Uh, who else uses, I got my phone here, the, the OnX app? Anybody? I got, I see one hand. There's Chad and uh, Gene. Far wide is another good example. Um, but basically that lets you, and, and I cover it in a lot of my, my videos. If you watch the one on the, um, the Pigeon River and I, I talk about, all right, I'm on it and here I can see this is a landowner, this is public, this is private, you know, that's, that's an important tool. Uh, paddling guidebooks, there's a couple at the register. Um, on, our, on our different, you know, there's a guidebook. What's the, Fletch, what's the author? <coughs> Is Fletch in here? He stepped out. You know, go to the register. There's, there's, um, you know, one on the Flint, the Chattahoochee, and the Akmolgi, I think. I brought one here. This one's uh, local to me. Pennsylvania is the Keystone State. This is Keystone Canoeing by Edward Gertler. And 
what a paddling guidebook gives you is um, you'll have maps that, that show you distances and access points and it goes into depth in terms of you know you're going to experience it at mile 3.2 a class uh, 2 plus rapid and it'll tell you that the sneak route is on the right hand side details like that that are that are just helpful if you're going to a section river for the first time to know what hazards that you can expect and sometimes it even tells you if you're going to portage you you portage on left side not the right saves you some time gives you more time for for fishing um, I'm going to come back to, to this when we talk about gradient. Um, printed fishing maps. These are I'm actually using some of these are actually the uh, the thumbnails for different uh, YouTube you know different um, videos on my YouTube channel. Um, some of these like the Shenandoah River Atlas is a, is a really nice one. It's you know paper maps of you know old school paper maps are still really valuable. They give you some of that historical data that is uh, is going to help you find you know a really productive place to fish at the ruins of an old mill dam that like you may not know is there and you know th that kind of that kind of detail paper maps still matter um, this pre-trip research we actually did this while everyone was fishing the the KBF National Championship, and uh, I did that with Wade from, from Yakutak. We did this video, and I think we were scouting some part of the Harpeth. Um, and certainly word of mouth of other anglers. I think most, most of us rely on that as a security blanket a little bit too much, is that we, we go fishing based on what other people have told us. There is value in that, but I want you, I would hope that you would branch out beyond that, that comfort zone of knowing, hey, this is worth fishing or this is not worth fishing based on what someone else has told me. Be that person that knows, yeah, that section there, don't even bother, but the, the section above it is gold if you hit it at the right river level, you know, two days post rain. Um, and the other one, drive, just driving around and looking. And, and that's ultimately, where I landed on the Pigeon River the other day is I went really high in the watershed. I'm going to jump over to, to this word gradient. Um, I was high in the watershed in the in the Pigeon, and it was where all the whitewater rafting companies and the whitewater kayakers, you know, do their you know have their fun. And I looked at it and I found the gauge that I was you know. You know, that I looked at to see, all right, what is the river level? Is it coming up? Is it going down? And I just realized I'm too high in the watershed. So gradient is how many feet per mile that a river drops, okay? Um, I'm gonna just pick one in, in, this, uh, in this paddling guidebook. So Armstrong Creek, I actually know this one because I fished the mouth of it at the, the Susquehanna. Um, <coughs> section one, rudder road to mouth. Uh, it's a distance of 8.8 .8 miles. Uh, Gertler says it's a three mile um, float trip. Difficulty is of one, which means there's some class one rapids, and the gradient is 19. That's pretty high. That's a pretty aggressive, you know. It's, it's dropping pretty good. And as small as that is, it's probably, well, I know it's trout water, right? As opposed to, um, and hopefully I can pick another one, but, you know, once you get down to like 10 or less in the in gradient, that's more of your bass water. I'm not saying that they can't be in higher gradient than that, but you'll get a sense for it if you learn what the gradient is. Uh, and it's just a, it's, Overall, it's a measure how much white water is there. You know, the higher the number, the more white water. The lower the number, the more lazy, you know, meandy, meandering river there, you know, it's going to be. So, um, and you know, ultimately, what I ended up doing on the, the pigeon is I went to, I went to that upper end of the watershed, and it was too much. I mean, you know, I mean, I can paddle it, but I didn't think it was going to be good smallmouth water, and I just. <laughs> Just drove around and look, and I drove past a section and I saw a, a flat water pool, and I'm like, that's it. And I was right, and I caught a good smallmouth out of it that afternoon. Um, 
We'll talk a little bit about land use and a little bit um, what is, you know, if you, if you look on the watershed map, it looks like a big, a big leaf with all the veins going out, right? What happens in there? Is, it, is there a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people living there with shopping malls and, and, and roads and, and houses, or is it largely, you know, mountains and woods, or is, it, or is it a lot of agricultural land? So the land use has a lot of bearing on um, things like nutrient load, um, which is how much nitrogen or phosphorus, so just the water quality in general, the bottom substrate we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Um, and then you also look in terms of, you know, what I was just talking about on the pigeon. Are you in the headwaters? Are you somewhere in the middle? Or are you in the lower part, which can end up tidal? They all end up tidal. All watersheds end in, in they all, all water that falls on land goes to eventually to the ocean. That's where the tidal, um, you know, the tidal largemouth in particular that, that I've, you know, enjoy fishing in the Mid Atlantic is. Um, interactions with other species, we, we're running into this a little bit with the flathead on the Susquehanna, where they're, they're bucket biologists, people are bringing the flatheads further and further up and, and letting them loose because they like catching the flathead, but they're eating a smallmouth. I see the bite marks on them all the time. I don't like it, but. Um, there's another, you know, where you have overlap with trout and smallmouth. All of a sudden, you have these giant smallmouth in in the upper portions of these watersheds, and they're just eating those stocker trout and just getting fat. That happens on the upper um, the upper portions of the Shenandoah and Rappahannock and some other rivers. So if you have overlap of trout and and, and smallmouth or largemouth or spotted bass, you can just grow some giants, actually. Um, so I, I talk about dams in a shortcut to to getting to um, to some good water. If I've never seen it, I do look for dams, and I put in below and go up. And, and dams at the base of a dam, it's dangerous. And I got a whole video on it called uh, what do I call it? Fish magnet, fish magnet death machine. <laughs> and it does. It draws all the fish to it, but it kills people every year. And you know, I was, you know, I, I almost didn't finish it, but I wanted to address it because anglers are going to go where the fish are. And, and the message of that, you know, of that video is, yeah, throw your lure in there in the boil. Don't get too close. Don't let it suck you in because it will incorporate you and, and it'll drown you uh, if you snag. Don't get close enough that you can shake it off, just break it off. So um, we'll talk a little bit about grass and insects and, and how it relates to, to bottom substrate. Um, insects are the base, the baseline of all of your, um, I mean, they're the basis of, the, of all of your good fisheries. It starts with insects. Um, Small, you know, small minnows, crayfish, you know, they all feed the smaller fish that the bigger fish eat. And if you have good bugs, you have good, um, you know, good fisheries. So I'm going to jump down here. I kind of jumped ahead in this and I already started talking about um, gradient. Um, this is actually a ledge on the, this is part of McKee's Half Falls on the Susquehanna River. And this is one of the videos where I just talk about the, uh, Rogue Fishing Company drag strap and how useful that is. I do a lot of, of putting in somewhere and using the torpedo motor to go up to explore. And that way I, don't, I can do it solo and I don't have to have an, a float trip partner. And in order to do that, I do a lot of this where I have the drag strap and you know, I motor up to a shoal and then I can drag it up and over. Um, but we talked about you know, what gradient is, and in general, uh, largemouth are going to prefer the lower gradient, trout are going to like the higher gradient, and the, the smallmouth and the, the spotted bass can go anywhere, it seems, but the smallmouth are somewhere in the middle, you know, the, the smallmouth like that, that big gradient, so...
So let's talk about one of the things I did when I fished the uh, the French Broad and the um, and the Pigeon River last week, and and I, I got two videos. One of them's already up. I think I I think the thumbnail for it just says spot hit. So you can go watch that after you know tomorrow or some other time. Um, I look at the stream flow gauge to see what you know. Is it rising? Is it falling? I was actually going to fish with um, with Hans Newts on the North Fork Holston. I'm driving down 81 from Maryland, and I call him, and I'm like, "Stay in South Carolina. North Fork's getting blown out." I can see it because the the gauge is just going straight up. I'm like, "We'll find a place to fish closer to you where we've had less rain." But basically, you know the. Um, the gauge, and, and it'll actually have the reading of how many feet it is at the gauge, and then another one, which is cubic feet per, per second. This one's the, I think this is the Juniata. Yeah, it's Juniata up at Middle, Mapleton Depot. Um, there's Raystown Lake that's up there, and this was steady, and I think Raystown probably closed one of their gates, and then you had a little bit of a rain event that started that was going to raise it. This is a forecaster, and not every gauge has it, but it, it tells you what's going to happen in the future. Uh, this isn't always accurate, but you know for sure we had some rain coming in there expecting it to go up. It's nice if you have that. Not always accurate. Things that, that affect it that, that may not be accurate. If, if you have trees you know, that still have foliage, um, you know, once the leaves go down, you know, those, all of that terrestrial vegetation, all those grass and bushes and leaves, they're, they're sponging up less of that water because they don't have their leaves out. So more of, in the, in the winter, more of the rainfall gets into our rivers. So, um, but what I do is, and I actually started doing this, this one's dated 4-14-2003. These old composition notebooks. Who used these in grade school? And you, know, um, you don't see these anymore. But what I do is I have tabs for this one's um, this one's the Rappahannock, and the next one I have. I mean, I have historical data. This one's the Shenandoah main stem. You know, going way back where I'm writing. Okay, I put in a coot store on. Uh, it looks like February 22nd of 2003. The, the river level went from 2.2 to 8.3 while I was out. So I was out there for a while. And, you know, I list what the water temperature was, the put in the takeout, and what I caught. And, and water clarity. I recorded water clarity. So if you start doing this and keeping a record of gauges with your trips, you're going to start developing... And this isn't so much here for me to consult because my home rivers, I just know. I can look at the Remington gauge on the Rappahannock and be like, it's a 4.69, it's already pretty muddy, but it's on the drop from 8. So in two days, yeah, it's going to be an upper threes. I'm going. It's going to fish well. So the process of, of recording your river levels and in, in what the clarity is and how well it fished is going to teach you so much about bass behavior in in regards to you know the the stream flow trend uh, and typically in in bigger rivers it doesn't matter as much when it gets up like the Susquehanna is huge and if it gets up and it's muddy I'm happy fishing it you know it it, it pushes them into to the real predictable eddies and uh, those fish know how to chew when it's it's muddy. But a smaller river, you know, watershed like the Rappahannock, when it gets up, it's not going to stay up long because it's not a big watershed. And if you can go further up and it's going to clear earlier, um, muddy water on that watershed shuts down the bite. So keeping a record of your, you know, of the stream flow is, is a really good idea. <coughs> So, in terms of, you know, top of the watershed, um, middle watershed, this one's actually, uh, this is my buddy Jake, and uh, here I am, we're dragging up 
some upper portion of the Shenandoah. We filmed this back in the late summer. Um, this is an upper watershed. This is somewhere that, honestly, most people drive over it and, and overlook it and think, no, it's, you know, that's, that's a creek. Um, the creek fishing that over, people overlook is some of the best fishing that's out there. But being is that it's, it's closer to the headwaters, uh, you may have some crossover with the trout. Um, you're going to need some whitewater paddling skills. It's yeah. going to be, it's going to be a fairly high gradient section. So you you need to, you know, know how to handle um, some whitewater, and look for springs. When you're up in the mountains, um, there is a lot of spring activities, you know, in the mountains, and that's why they're good for the trout because even in the summer, that cool water oozing up through the the earth keeps those, those trout, which need that high oxygen content and colder water that, that keeps the oxygen saturation high. Um, but those springs are, are totally fish magnets. I fished some section of the, uh, the Holston below Cherokee back in July, and I'm, and I'm cruising up, I'm, I'm motoring along, and I'm just, I'm just fishing the jackhammer going fast, and I'm like, whoa, there's a lot of fish there. It was carp catfish, some bass, a little bit of everything, some other ones I didn't recognize, and, and I parked it and I, I sat on that spot and I fished them and I caught a bunch, and if you want to watch that video, I didn't acknowledge it in that video because I edited it and then I went back and thought that it had to have been a spring, you know, and, and you know, in the summer, those fish like that cool water and they, and they go up in there and they just hang out there for a while and then they go back out to the deeper water, so. Mid watershed, um, you know, it's a mix of both higher gradient and some white water with slower pools. Uh, and this is typically in the Piedmont area, the foothills, not not up in the mountains, you know. And that's what I found the other day when I was, you know, way up on the, the Pigeon River, and then I moved down towards, I think the town was called Newport. I was ten miles up from Newport, and that was foothills, and that's where I found good winter water. So lower gradient, but then if you go all the way down, and, and I'm going to use like Eastern Virginia or, or even the, the tidal Potomac as an example, once it becomes tidal, or even if it's not tidal and, and it's still, you move into the lowlands, there's less gradient and it becomes more largemouth water. It carries a higher sediment load because it doesn't have the, you know, the current to continually flush it out. So it's, it's better for, for largemouth. And that's where subaquatic vegetation kind of um, becomes the, the important thing. If, if you don't have grass, you don't have bass. And it's, it's about growing the, uh, you know, growing the insect base is, is part of it. Um, it. It feeds the crayfish, helgramites, mad tom, sculpins, everything that a bass eats needs, that, uh, needs the vegetation. And you know, in that lower watershed, you have a lot of sediment or silt that, that falls out. The vegetation can, can really help to make a strong bass fishery. So uh, I can already jumped ahead here. Um, so these are a couple, um, that's actually a 610 river smallmouth from, the, that was in the, the river bass and tournament. It was 610 out of Susquehanna. Um, this was actually a, a large mouth. It was in a lower gradient um, river in Virginia. That was also, I think that, no, I think that one's about 6.5. So, like I just said, I think I jumped ahead on this, uh, what I was just talking about. But um, for sure, bugs and you know, bugs are the basis of it, and this is where I'm going to jump into my, my visual aids. Can someone turn lights on so I can, I can talk about a concept called interstitial space? So if you guys can look here at this, I picked these rocks up in the, in the creek um, behind Fletch's house this morning, right? And if you look here, you look at all these spaces between the rocks. That is where we grow bugs. When the bugs are, have a place to, to be in their larval stage and they have that habitat where maybe they aren't picked off by 
the things that eat them right away, you can grow a lot of bugs in there. But when the land use uh, in that watershed is either a lot of development or um, agricultural that uses a lot of tilling. Now, I live on a farm, my, my wife's family farm in Maryland. We do a lot of soil conservation practices like keeping the cattle out of the, the water, having watering you know, areas away from them just walking into the creek, trampling the, the bank around it. Um, <sighs> They do cover crops and no-till farming. They do a lot of things because they want to keep their dirt in, you know, in the places where they are. And when that dirt and that nutrient load gets, you know, ends up in the, in the watershed, uh, you have siltation, right? And what that siltation does is over time, you have these, you lose these interstitial spaces, right? And, and you can see it in places like we just had the KBF National Championship on uh, Kentucky Lake and where the Duck, Duck River came out, it was one big mud flat. That is siltation, where you go from, from having a lot of current and a good flow that, that keeps, keeps all that flushed out and gives you those interstitial spaces to where it all fills in and you don't have places to grow the, you know, to grow the bugs. So I'm just taking some sand and this is soil erosion happening, right? And all of these, all of the silt and this, you know, the sand is going to fill in. I'm just kind of pouring some in there. And all of a sudden, you see all of that filling in, right? And you're reducing the number of places you can have that, those, those spaces between the rocks. We're going to give it a little bit more and it's all going to fill in. And when this happens too much, then you end up with rivers like, and I've seen them out in Ohio and in Indiana in the heavy agricultural areas. I have the uh, Patapsco in Maryland, which, which has a whole lot of, um, just a whole lot of develop, development in general. Like it's a very populated part with a lot of, you know, a lot of flooding as a result of a whole lot of um, humanity really. So you start filling that in, and this has reduced the number of bugs that a, you know, that a watershed can create and reduce the amount of food, the forage base for, for growing all those eventual bass. But it starts with, you know, the crayfish, the helgramites, the mad toms. Yes? So like with big reservoirs, like here in Atlanta, we have Allison and we have Lanier. At the mouths of the rivers, by the time it's the north side of the reservoir, you see a lot of, like, and I'll tell you specifically, like, where, um, the animal, the yep, a lot of siltation. It is, and but here we come to the saving grace of those lower gradient rivers. Now, a high gradient river will occasionally flush out whatever sedimentation you had, and it'll open up those those interstitial spaces, and and it's good again. If you have that flush, you have that current. But when it's a lower gradient river. The saving grace is grass. So in the low country, Piedmont, uh, and I'd say even you know when you have the river goes into the reservoir, you're gonna have that big mud flat. But a little bit beyond that, you're gonna have the, the grass beds, if you're lucky, start growing. And, and usually this only happens in the reservoirs that they keep them at a steady, you know, they, they, they don't fluctuate up and down a whole lot. Um, once you get that grass, then you can grow the bugs when the grass, you know, that's habitat. It's really just surface area, whether it's a rock, you know, the spaces between the rocks or the vegetation itself. So those are two things in terms of habitat is the interstitial spaces of the rock on the river bottom and the grass with the, the lower gradient. And land use is a, is a big part of that. Um, you know, I've, I was going to talk about um, some rivers in Indiana and Illinois that, are, that have been channelized. Uh, they just, they want to maximize the agriculture there. In, and I bet you see some of it in Ohio where you live now, where it should be a river that's going like this, but they've dredged it to go straight. And that way they maximize the, the agricultural use. And we need that. Everyone in this room eats, everyone depends on agriculture, but 
it does come back to soil conservation practices, and I'm proud that, that my family dairy farm that I married into does things really well. They do the cover crops. They do the, you know, the fencing off the riparian buffer where they, they leave all the vegetation around the creeks to, to hold on to the dirt. Um, they, don't, they don't till their soil. They actually do the cover crops and then plant the corn right through that. It keeps the dirt where it is, keeps our, you know, and, and it has an impact further down the line in terms of that nutrient load not ending up in the uh, Monocacy River than Potomac and, and which, you know, more nutrient load over a long period of time is what causes the dead zones and, and kills our striped bass out of the Chesapeake Bay. It's excess nutrient. So um, we'll come back to development in general. When you have parking lots, rooftops, roads that, that hit an impermeable surface, it, it takes that rain, that quick rain, and puts it into the creek uh, that goes into the river, and you have flash floods. Now, we had that in um, Ellicott City, Maryland, on the Patapsco, and two really historic ones that, I mean, tore through that town, destroyed businesses, took all of the cars on the road, and killed a bunch of people. And then it happened again, like, the next year. And they were historically like way beyond what they consider a statistical 100-year flood. Um, why did you get to them that quick? It's because upstream from there, more pavement, more you know, parking lots and rooftops and roads and, and, and not enough wetlands, not enough. And, and I think in a lot of development, we've gotten smarter where we said, okay, we're building pavement, but we need this catchment pond over there to absorb some of that rain. We're getting better at it, but not you know, not everywhere would be as good as, and when we remove the wetlands, we, we remove, you know, the ability to absorb that rain and, and let it get into our, our um, Yes. If you go into, if you go down to Florida and you look at areas like, we did some of the, the redfish tournaments down there, what, like, was it Mosquito Lagoon is one of them? Used to be amazing fishing and now there's only like one or two places left that have have grass and that's where all of the redfish and speckled trout are but it used to be this massive area of grass what happened well everyone moved down there to retire it's development and development overall just you know when rain hits it just pushes down there and that slug of water hits it hard and and you have that sedimentation that, it, that degrades our our grass and then also our, our fisheries as a result. Um, industrial pollution, um, outdated water, wastewater treatment. I was actually with the, the Coosa River Keeper some time ago and, I, and we got on the water and he showed me some of the discharge pipes. He showed me a, a, um, a coal ash pond that was six tenths of a mile or something above their, their, their water intake. By the way, if you stay in Gadsden, Alabama, like don't drink the municipal water. It's got arsenic in it from that coal ash plant. Anyhow, the and, and the, the mayor will tell you, I don't drink the water here. We got a problem. Um, all of these different pollution sources. What's that? <laughs> tell me again. I'll do this one. Okay. Don't drink the water. Don't drink. Get bottled water. So. Agricultural use, we talked a little bit about this. I know that the, the Shenandoah Riverkeeper worked a lot when we had the fish kills that wiped out 80% of our smallmouth bass in the early 2000s. That Riverkeeper worked with 4-H and FFA to, tell, to teach that next generation of, of farmers, here's how you do a better job with keeping your dirt on your farm. You know? So that's some of, the, you know, some of the things that certainly help. But ultimately, we had river keepers, and this is Ted, he's the, the lower Susquehanna river keeper. This is a, um, you know, on the, in the conservation playlist on my YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, it, it's a very clickbaity title. He sues people that hurt small, smallmouth. But it ultimately can be true, and it is true sometimes. Like, he's, he's brought lawsuits to local municipalities that have, um, that let all the, well, even Harrisburg, he's suing Harrisburg on behalf of the river using the Clean Air and Water Act um, to make sure that 
to, to hold Harrisburg responsible to stop letting raw sewage go right into the river that we all enjoy fishing, you know. So river keepers are something, and I got a Flint River Keeper shirt here. If you have a river keeper, you should know that person. You should look up who they are. You can go to waterkeeper.org and look up and see if you have a river keeper. Um, call that person. Say, hey, I'm an angler. I'm on this water regularly. Just wanted to say hi. And uh, if I see anything weird, something that smells wrong, looks wrong, sounds wrong, I'll let you know. I'll be your eyes and ears. That's what they need more than anything. Yes, they do need fundraising because they do this as their full-time job, but they also need us to be eyes and ears. So learn who your river keepers are and, uh, and introduce yourself. You know, be eyes and ears for them. Our biggest river keeper here, by the way, y'all don't know the Chattanooga River Keeper. Uh, Mallory Pen Pendleton is there, like, in, in charge of the river keeper now, so. Yeah. Where, wherever you are, I mean, it's waterkeeper.org will help you look it up by watershed. So, and I've looked them up. I've been, I saw something on the Harpeth and, and I ended up sending photos and video of a discharge pipe to the Tennessee River Keeper. Tennessee River Keeper. So, finding less pressure water. Uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier. There's my still chainsaw and I, I cut down things that are in my, well, I should temper that. I will go explore, and I'll move upstream, and I'll get to that first big log jam, and I will drag over it and leave it intact. And then the second one, I cut it down. Third one, fourth one, I cut it all down. And then I own it. I own from that first log jam up. I'm gonna, it's a gate. It keeps other people from doing what I'm doing and, and taking advantage of my hard work. <laughs> all right? And I get to the, I get to go there and just, own all of that, you know, because other people aren't going to work as hard as I do. And that's that's a whole lot of what that guy does to win tournaments. So, um, but you need, you absolutely need an ethic of exploration. You need to have that, you know, that drive to, to get to water that other people haven't seen, to have the skills and the tools to to go upstream and, and overcome barriers. And sometimes the barriers are, are legal, finding the legal access, finding public access, and knowing, knowing your, your rights as a, someone that can use the river, but also knowing when you're, you're wrong and you're trespassing, and, and finding those places that you're, you're gonna be legal. That legal barriers are there, physical barriers. I do a lot of, um, dropping my kayak straight down 15 feet because, hey, from from that signpost to, to that sycamore tree, this is where I can go in legally. So I use straps to go down. Um, I use the motors. I do a lot, and I've mentioned this before. Uh, this is actually Russ zooming up um, the river at the national championship. I followed him and, and filmed him. You ought to check that one out. It's uh, I think the thumbnail says 50K win. And... Uh, it's, the motor was a critical part of that, and having the Torquedo Ultralight 1103 see uh, it's 105 pound thrust and be able to, to bam, shoot up those, those rapids and, and explore. It's a powerful tool in, in your own exploration. Um, the drag strap I mentioned earlier uh, in the, the other video where I'm dragging up McKee's Half Falls, I uh, mentioned the Rogue Fishing Company drag strap. If you don't you know, have one of those yet, you can absolutely use a, just a tie-down strap. I like the Rogue, it's just more comfortable in my hand. Uh, chainsaws, and I keep a handsaw on the back of my, it's a silky handsaw, on the, um, it's like tree guys use it. And honestly, I carry it, you know, it's a serrated blade about, a curved serrated blade about that big with a nice handle. I use it so that when I get this chainsaw pinched, I don't have to leave it at the river. I can, <laughs> I can get my chainsaw out of it. Um, and I do have some videos on, on um, with a tree guy, it's Chris Watts up my way, on the right way to use chainsaws safely. So, Onyx, um, or what, what was the other one you mentioned besides Onyx? Far wide. Far wide. Those, those are tools that get you in there. Another one was hunting, pretty much any hunting property after the work. Yep. 
and even though Farwell is a big sponsor of like all the kayak fishing stuff, there's a new one that a former spec ops got developed called Spartan Forge. It's literally probably the best one I've ever seen. It takes Google Maps and say it again. Spartan Forge. It's a veteran owned company. Spartan Forge. Yeah, that guy's like next level stuff. Spartan Forge. I'm gonna have to look it up. Um, I don't know where I put this in. Just probably because it's winter, and this is where I'm gonna be. We're going to be focused on winter habitat, deep, slow moving, slow to no current access to a high water refuge. When that river comes up and floods in winter, they're cold. They need to move a very short distance to get out of the way of that river just blowing through there. So when you find those high water refuge, usually it's a little notch in the bank or creek mouth in an otherwise calm, flat pool where they winter. Um, Smaller rivers, um, you're going to have to find the winter pools in summer. I know this sounds silly, but if it's a smaller river and you're able to cover um, a lot of miles and find that long unbroken pool or find that deep water when it's at its summer low, sometimes in drought conditions, they're going to be in the same pools that they are in winter. So I find some of my best winter holes when it's 90 degrees out. Um, Y'all can read the rest of that if you want. I'm gonna jump to creative access point. This is this is my truck on the side of the road and you can see the snow under the, you know, in the background. On the, you know, I was able to figure out that, you know, 10 feet out from that, that bridge was actually, you click on it with the on it says Virginia <coughs> Hotland. It's public, right? I just can't go too far into where someone has their camp there. And I've had them watch me and just kind of like nod and I'm picking up trash as I go. Picking up trash is probably the best way to open doors for yourself. Um, when you pull in a place, even though you know that it's public and it's, you know, in case someone pulls up and says, what are you doing here? And you say, I'm picking up this tire and putting it in my truck or I'm picking up all this trash. Oh, okay. Well, my cousin Bobby's got Launch right down there. Yeah, it opens up doors. So pick up trash as you go. Uh, we talked a little bit about springs earlier, so I'm going to keep moving. I know I'm getting close on time, so I'm speeding up. I will mention my buddy Jed here. And don't tell conservation officers they're not real cops. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so he's got a, that's an over five pound fish, and that was in an absolute, it's really in a creek. Like, there wasn't any part of that that you couldn't cast across. So that's the kind of small water big fish that you can find. Uh, springtime, they tend to move towards, towards spawning habitat, and really they're, they're just current reflectors. Uh, this kind of the Gwinnett smallmouth was behind a big root ball that he was probably going to, you know, that was pre-spawn, but he's probably going to spawn there. You can get to areas where... There are ledge rocks, grass beds, um, and quick drop-offs that, uh, you know, in the springtime they move towards those areas and they move from the wintering areas to those. And I will say that you, you need not fish for, uh, for spawners on the beds to catch them in the spring to, to have a good time. If you target current seams, uh, those are fish that are, you know, that are not on a bed. They're, they're getting ready to spawn or they've come off the bed. Uh, that way, if you want to, you can, you can let those spawners do their thing. Um, this smallmouth was caught, you know, way up in a creek. And uh, I guarantee you that that is a Susquehanna River smallmouth that was up in this creek because they move up there because there's good spawning habitat in that tributary. So summertime, they spread way out in... You know, the feeding stations, the places that you can power fish for them. Um, whitewater and grass beds. Grass beds are just loaded because, again, coming back to the insects, those bugs, that's where the food is. That's where the food of the food of the food is. You know, that, that's where everything starts. Uh, but also whitewater is just a great feeding station. There's a lot of oxygen. I know it from getting in, in the Susquehanna River with my kids and we all put the, the scuba mask and the snorkel on and go face down in that river. And 
if you're in that bubbly white water, there's mad toms and sculpins and helgramites and, and darters and, and all sorts of and little smallmouth and big ones because they're looking at you kicking up stuff and you're like, I'm gonna eat there. This, this idiot here in the river is you know, uncovering all the food. And when you back away from that water, even like 20 feet, it's like, it, it's, it's devoid of food. And then you move back into there. So white water is a great place for them to feed. Um, I like to fish the upstream side of a grass bed. Uh, that's a good place for them to, to just chill and conserve energy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that most people overlook. So look at the upstream side of, of those objects. Um, you know, people get used to fishing the eddy on the downstream side of it so much in the, in the spring they overlook, you know, fish upstream from it. So, uh, and then fall is, I say, bipolar feeding activity. They're, in the fall, they have days where they're just crazy and they eat everything, and then followed by a cold front, and it's like, you got to finesse every single bite you got. And it's, and it's tough, and then it's exciting. And you have this awesome day of fishing, and you're like, this is the best, I can't wait to go again. And the next day, it's like, Ugh. it got cold, and they're like hugging tight to the wood and, and you gotta throw a shaky head in there and just let it sit there for three minutes and they'll eventually eat it. But you can't go fast and, and make them eat. Um, and, and really that's that's the success of, you know, cold front and then it, it gets colder and then they get used to it and it stabilizes and then they start eating again, you know. And these are two videos I did, I think right before the KBF National Championship, these were I think you're both on the Harpeth, um, part one and part two. And it, and it, you know, on the second day, I had that more aggressive, because um, it had stabilized, I, I actually got a jackhammer bite going. First day, they were still in cold shock, and I had to throw a jig and fish it slow, tight to wood. So my best advice for that time of year is to, you know, adjust from finesse to power fishing and back to finesse. you got to try both. That's good advice anyways. I mean, people who are really good at always getting a limit and then going for a big limit, regardless of the conditions, are good at both power fishing, which is fishing you know, fast and big and, and in those, those feeding zones of white water and grass beds. And, and then if that isn't working, being able to downshift and say, okay, I'm gonna fish that, you know, finesse jig close and tight to the wood and, and you know, recognizing when you need to to shift from one to the other. And, and I'll, I'll say this much, if all you ever do is finesse fish, you're always gonna catch fish, but you're gonna miss out on those days where they are pounding, you know, big, aggressive, fast moving baits. And you're gonna miss those epic days because you're only covering this much water and you could be power fishing, covering so much more and catching lots of big fish. So you, you have to switch back and forth, especially in the fall in order to, you know, to recognize which is the best for that, you know, that particular day. So uh, here's a summary, and these are these are just some of my sharp illustrations from some of my other videos um, where I try to explain, you know, a plus spot. This is that upstream upstream of the grass bed thing. Um, I do a lot with sharpies to try and educate in in my videos and. Uh, just gave you a little sample of it in terms of explaining, you know, sweet spots in the eddy and, and so forth. But this is my summary slide. This is the last one. I encourage you to develop an ethic of exploration. And, you know, that really requires having a resilience of, of being okay with skunk trips. You know, going to somewhere that no one told you to go there. You just want to go check it out. And, and it could be a dud. You could get there and it's all silted in and you catch few if any fish and they're, you know, they're small. And you're like, well, I learned that that's not a good section. You know, you do enough of those, you're gonna stumble into, oh my God, I had to use a chainsaw, I got in there and it's full of like five, six pound, you know, large mouth and it's awesome and I own it, you know. So you only get that with the ethic of exploration and the tools for using that you know, for that successful ethic of exploration and 
finding new spots. Um, whitewater guidebooks I mentioned in, in you know, Fletch, you get a couple local ones here at the register. Um, Onyx apps and the, and the other, the far wide, and the, say it again, Spartan something or other? Spartan Forge. Spartan Forge is one I will have to check out. Uh, Google Maps, <coughs> everyone knows Google Maps. USGS stream flow gauge data, chainsaws, and more than anything, just being eager to fish somewhere you've never been before. That, that's the key, and that's, that's my favorite place to fish. Somewhere I've never seen before. People ask me that, and they're like, you fished all over the place. What's your favorite river? And it's the one that I'm gonna fish next time that I've never seen. Like, I love exploring. Um, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Little Stuff, and, and really, you know, dig into the playlist. Kayak fishing skills is a great one to start with, but I, I have, you know, the different species specific ones that will help you know, catered to the type of black bass, you know, river black bass you like to uh, to catch. River bass habitats, you know, it's gradient, stream flow, what part of the watershed, the headwater, the middle portion of the tidal, uh, grass and bugs, so critically important. Um, please go to waterkeeper.org, know your river keepers, talk to them, call them on the phone, introduce yourself, say I'm a, I'm a kayak angler here, Anything I can do to help, but and, and then you put their you you go to your contacts and you say Ted Susquehanna Riverkeeper, and that way when you're out there you be like Hey Ted, um, I got I got a video to send you. I, it's, this is not good, and I need you to know what's going on. So the eyes and ears for your riverkeeper. Um, seasonal movements of bass within a river system. It's basically they want to conserve energy. And they want to eat. Um, in the winter, they, you know, the energy conservation is is about being in, in lower flow um, and not burning a lot of calories. So it's that that low flow areas. Um, they're certainly driven in the spring um, for their need to spawn, and then they want to have a, a stable supply of food. So thank you guys for coming. I'm I'm ready for questions. We got five minutes worth. <laughs> Go ahead. Give it your choice. Would you rather fish an up, an up or just you know, surge water on, on a river or a down a down a trend? Uh, a rising river or a falling river? Um, it's, if I can get there at the beginning of it going up before it really turns turbid and if it's a small river, yeah, fishing the rise can be amazing. Uh, if if it's up and muddy and it's coming down, if it's a big river, that's fine. If it's a small river, it's, it's going to be tougher. And, and you can work and make that happen. The good thing about high water is that, say this is a river, and it's a torrent, and it's going there fast. They're definitely all going to be clustered in here. Maybe two of them here. A bunch of them here, and the same thing on this side. It's obvious. When the river comes up, the places that they're going to be, you can quickly visually identify, yep, that's still water with the foam just sitting there, barely moving, if at all. That's where they are. I mean, I love fishing the Susquehanna River when it's at flood stage. I know it sounds crazy, but like, it jams all the fish into a these, you know, there aren't many of them, but like you drop a jig down in there and you're just like bouncing off of fish backs and it never even reaches the bottom and you're hooked up. They're all there. So high water can be fun in a bigger. Does that make sense? Yeah. Another question? <coughs> What's up, Craig? Super clear, super low water, like, you know, in July, August, where it's just not a lot of rain. I have a video I want you to watch and the thumbnail says <coughs> selfish. Well, I think I'm not going to watch them. But give, give me your three top baits on that. Um, seven inch scented jerk shad, seven inch scented jerk shad, seven inch jerk shad. <laughs> <laughs> I am shutting that thing and I'm shutting that thing. I'm skiing it. But look at that. I mean, yeah. the first two were pearl, the third one's welcome. But, you know, you're just skiing it back. And, and in that, that skinny, shallow water, you know, they will blast it. 
I know some fish reservoirs over here in Palatina. Yep. And the Dodger reservoirs. Yep. My kayak is a barge, obviously, mm -hmm. for that, made for that. Just the hands about to get up and down with the other one and and stuff. Yeah. I mean, a river kayak, in your opinion, a river kayak is pretty much like, it's, if you're an advocate kayak fisherman, that's like a must have investment. Yeah, it, it depends. And in, in, um, we got three new river kayaks on the market, and everyone wants me to, you know, to, to compare them. And I will say that this one, the Sholey, is the one that is for the most aggressive white water. Um, but they're all, you know, they're all shorter and more maneuverable. You can lean on the edge and turn it good so you have that maneuverability. Um, they're not barges so you can drag it up over stuff you know and they have that secondary stability so if you have a barge and you lean on it like this and it doesn't move that's that's overabundant primary stability and it actually makes you slow if it if it's more of an acorn shaped hull than a surfboard you know you can and I, that's in all my videos that I test them and flip them and talk about secondary stability but yeah you, if you're gonna river fish you should get a, a boat that's designed for river fishing that's the other thing I've learned too so a lot of people get in like a river specific kayak that are used to you know when I have this one twenty seven they say it's, oh this feels really tippy but it's, you, you would say it's not tippy that's like yeah. a secondary so, stability engagement right stability is not purchased yeah is earned and every new boat you get you need to earn it by flipping it and then you get the benefit of learning how to reboard which will save your life someday if the first time you're learning to reboard is in an emergency situation you your candidate should be a statistic you're you're gonna you can be the person that that dies because they don't they panic and don't know how to get back in it so flip boats you get a new one flip it and learn how to reboard it so i'm going to queue up uh Dr. Sammons, are you? Are we, I can go. I mean, if you want to go. Are last, you going first? Are you going next? Yeah, I might. Y'all want to have a ten minute break? Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I guess I just yeah, we got to look good. We got to get some swag here yeah. too. So. so a lot of this. Um, <laughs> hey, thanks for calling everybody again. Thanks to Flex the guys here at uh, Westbrook. Big round of applause, It is actually cool and fitting that we uh, ended with Dr. Sammons talking about the shoal bass because we are going to be giving away a crescent shoaly, in which case, of course, we designed it to help help with a lot of the issues that he's talking about and support the Flint River Keeper. Henry Jackson from the Flint River Keeper wanted to be here. He was supposed to be here. And kind of like me, he has, he has young twins, and they, uh, they give him a strap, he said. So he is sick and couldn't make it. But the, um, some of the proceeds from tonight are going to that cause as well as a portion of every sale of the Crescent Shirley, of course, that you can get here at, uh, at Westbrook. So let's get this thing away. You guys all got your app tickets out. Let's see here. It's uh, 76507. Raise your hand if you're still in this. You've got one number left. Oh, you guys are in it. All right. Nine. Thank <laughs> you.